possible because the lion from the tribe of Judah became the Lamb of God on your behalf so that you can become a child of God. This is the good news. This is the one who's worthy of your worship. Would you guys welcome with a Sozo welcome? Chris Overstreet. Well, it is an honor to be here with you guys. Apostle Tom, Apostle Katie, it's, a, it's just an honor. And I've got a word for you. And I, I want I wanted the congregation, Sozo Church, to be able to hear this. While, while in worship, I was, um, I was seeing these empty churches across America. And um, I believe that the Lord is raising up apostolic ministries right now in America where there's training centers to be able to, to develop pastors and leaders to be able to help take churches. And, and this is what I said, and I shared it a little bit with you um, over the phone. But I believe that the Lord is releasing favor on your guys' life for property. I, I believe it. I believe that you guys are going to inherit churches I believe that there is going to be resources, extended resources that are going to come into your midst. I believe that the Lord is going to bless you to be a blessing, to be a blessing, to be able to blessing. Abraham had a blessing on his life. And I believe that there's an Abrahamic blessing upon your life. And so in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, God, even in the next two and a half months, Lord, let it be, Lord, the rolling out of new property in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you, God, for what you're doing, God. We thank you, God, for churches all across America, Lord, that, that are shutting down, but you're going to raise up fathers and mothers to be able to take those churches in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Lord. We bless, we bless, we bless in Jesus' name. Amen. Sozo Church, it's a great honor to be able to be with you this morning. My wife sends her love to you, and um, she would be here this weekend, but we've had a lot of things going on. My daughter's birthday was yesterday. Um, the, the night before that, my, my sister-in-law's birthday. Well, this is a birthday weekend. My father's birthday is today. I'm going back, and we're going to have a party afterwards, and, uh, and I'll be with you tomorrow night. But my wife sends her love, and... Um, my wife and I, we met at a backpack giveaway in Redding, California. Many years ago, I was the outreach uh, pastor there. I shook her hand. She blushed. And I said, I'm going to get to know this one. And... Um, <laughs> And after the outreach was over, I gave her a ring a week later, and I promised her three things. I promised to protect her heart, promised to protect her purity, and I promised to be a man of prayer for the leading guiding of the relationship. We just celebrated our 15-year anniversary vacation. Our actually anniversary is on June 21st, but we just got back from Hawaii celebrating 15 years. And so I had a great vacation. We've got two little girls. We've got an eight-year-old. Uh, her name is Brielle, and uh, she just celebrated her eight-year birthday yesterday. And then we also have a two-year-old, and her name is Jubilee. And uh, so they all send their love to you. I'll just share maybe a testimony or so with Brielle and, and some of the things that God's been doing in her life and through her life uh, the next two days that we have together. Let's pray as, as we get started. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your anointing. And I'm asking, Holy Spirit, that you would come in a powerful way this morning. Have your way. Thank you for your training. Thank you for your equipping. Thank you for your mobilization. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you want to jump on our email list, you can. Uh, we're sending stuff out, and we're giving away stuff, and I'll talk about something else that we're giving away in just a second. And uh, also, if you want to find out where we're at with our gospel truck, uh, you can get on board with this and uh, through email, and we will let you know what is happening. I want to show you a video of our evangelism school that is free, and uh, the reason why we decided to make this free is because wherever I travel, the number one thing 
that pastors and leaders are asking me for is more help in the area of evangelism. They say, Chris, we need help in our church for evangelism. So we built this evangelism e-course based on the request of many pastors saying we need help. Go ahead and watch this real quick. The number one need I'm hearing from pastors all across America is to see the body of Christ trained and equipped to share the gospel. Because of this need, we want to invite you to be a part of a free eight-week evangelism course that will help teach, equip, and activate the everyday believer to share the good news of Jesus Christ. It is perfect for individuals and small groups within your church or your ministry. Some of the topics that we're going to be covering is how to discover your Jesus story and share it, what is the good news, and how the Holy Spirit is the greatest evangelist and how the Holy Spirit wants to partner with you. We have a vision to see a minimum of 10,000 people this year make a commitment to go through this course and start sharing the gospel every day. When we only have one life to live, let's live our life as it makes sense in the light of eternity. Register today at CompassionAction.com. It's free. You can go ahead and register for that um, right now. We just uh, released this. It was about four and a half weeks ago. Uh, 31 countries are going through this right now. 31 downloads in different countries, separate countries, in 42 states in America. And so our vision is we want to see a minimum of 10,000 people um, sharing the gospel every single day. And if that's the case, we'll see 3,650,000 people have an opportunity in one year through training and equipping uh, to be able to receive Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Um, next weekend, we are going to be in Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, we are going with our large mobile gospel truck. So we have a couple gospel trucks, and uh, this year alone, we're, we're praying and believing for two more gospel trucks, and uh, where we help mobilize young evangelists to take the gospel all over America. But we're going to be in Nashville, Tennessee um, this weekend, and um, we need more intercessors. So we need more intercessors wherever we go. We would you do something? Adopt us in intercession as we travel. Uh, go ahead and show that video. that takes place is the miracle of a changed and transformed heart. You know, we got this, we got this particular gospel truck in the midst of the pandemic. So the Lord spoke to me in 2019, at the end of 2019 on December 7th, and he said, 2020 is going to be a year of courage. Don't shrink back in fear. In April 2020, the Lord told me to get a gospel truck and that we would take it around America to be able to preach the gospel. In the midst of everything, in the midst of the pandemic, the Lord provided. And I want to say, and I want to echo what Apostle Tom said, don't worry, don't get into fear, God will provide. If God's told you to do something, he will back up his word over your life. And that's what he's done for us. And, and we're extremely thankful of what the Lord has done throughout the last few years. Um, I want to talk to you today about praying for Bob. I want to talk to you about praying for Bob, and Bob represents three things. I've got some notes up here that I want you to, to look at in just a moment, but Bob represents three things. It represents a burden for the lost, compassion for the lost. It represents opportunities to be able to share, and it also represents a boldness to speak the word of the Lord. I believe that this morning, the Spirit of the Lord will impart compassion to you. Yeah. I believe he's going to impart something into your heart. Now, let me just say something really quickly. I could talk to you about techniques of sharing the gospel. And those techniques can be activated in your heart and your life. And you can see even fruit. But if you want to see long-term fruit in your life, there's this one word that is so needed. 
and it's compassion. Because compassion keeps us going. We're reminded that God has compassion for you and I. And I want to share a little bit about my own story, about my own journey. I got saved when I was 18 years old, when I was in jail. And um, fast forward, I went to school of ministry a few years after that. And I remember when I was in school of ministry in Redding, California, that um, I was praying and I was praying for compassion. And I went through a series of just praying, God, I need more compassion. If I'm going to get activated in what you have for me, I need more love. Because how many people know that you can move in the gifts, but not still move in love? And it's a very dangerous thing. And I said, God, I need your heart. I need to fill your heart. I want to respond by your heart. And one day I was, uh, I was outside of uh, McDonald's. It was a parking lot and I saw someone walk by. Something began to happen. Something began to tug on my heart. It was compassion. It was the heart of God. And as this individual walked by, I began to weep and cry. And I said, Lord, you're doing it. I don't understand what's happening. But I can feel something different here. And I'll tell you, the Lord wants to impart his compassion for you and I. Pay attention to your tears because inside your tears is a message. So I begin to weep and cry for this individual soul. And I went on a journey of Feeling, okay, I, I, I feel your heart, God, for people. And it's his heart that leads us into action. I want you to turn with me to your Bibles, to Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. And we're going to see a pattern of the heart of Jesus on display here. In verse 35, it says this, And Jesus went about all the cities and the villages teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitude, say, saw the multitude. He was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into the harvest. I believe that the Lord wants to ignite our prayer life to be able to pray for Bob. We need a burden. We need compassion. If we're going to fulfill the call of God that's on our life, and that is to make disciples that will make disciples that will make disciples, we need compassion. We need his heart. It's his heart that the Lord wants to impart to us. But God doesn't want to just give us his heart. He wants to open our eyes to be able to see the opportunities that are all around us. God wants to begin to open our eyes to be able to see the opportunities. Something began to happen to me when I began to feel his heart. I noticed that I saw people differently. I began to see individuals differently. I saw the opportunities that the Lord placed all around me. Ephesians talks about, and Ephesians chapter 1 talks about the eyes of our heart being opened up. How many people are you saying, God, I want my eyes to be able to open up. I want to see the opportunities that God has given to me. Do you know that God gives us opportunity every single day? God's given us opportunities all the time, but he wants to open our eyes to be able to recognize the opportunity. So you know, it's in your DNA to hear the voice of the Lord. In fact, you couldn't come to Jesus without hearing the voice of the Lord. And so we recognize opportunities by hearing his voice, him speaking to us. And a lot of times God speaks in many different ways. Like when you walk by someone, and you feel something in your heart for them, that is the voice of God. That is the heart of God for that individual. When you're doing something, the Lord begins to speak to you. He says, hey, I want you to do this. I want you to stop what you're doing, and I want you to do this. That is the heart of God giving you opportunities. But you know, we don't just need opportunities. We need boldness. I want you to turn to your Bibles to Acts chapter 4, verse 29. 
then I want to share some testimonies with you that I think is going to be able to help you. Verse 29, it says this. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness, they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. How many people have room for boldness in their life? I've got room for boldness. We need the Holy Spirit. Let me talk to you really quickly about worship. In John chapter 4, we see an encounter. We see Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman. And the topic comes up about worship. And the Samaritan woman wants to make it about a place or a space. Jesus wants to make it about a heart. Jesus says, I'm looking for those that will worship in spirit and in truth. I believe across America and beyond that God's going to raise up a worshiping tribe. And a worshiping tribe is not something that we do inside of a building as, as amazing as that is. But a worshiping tribe is a heart that is yielded to be able to say, God, I want your heart. I want to respond to your heart. I want to fill your heart. And I want to recognize the opportunities that you're giving to me. And because I'm worshiping you, I want to have boldness to be able to do what you're telling me to do. And I believe that God is raising up a worshiping tribe. And let me just say this really quickly. Worship, true biblical worship, when we look at John chapter 4, will always lead us into an expression of sharing the gospel. I want to say this again. True biblical worship leads us into a place of communicating the gospel of Jesus Christ. What happened to this woman? She has an encounter with Jesus. And as she has this encounter with Jesus, she came for water. She brought a water pot. She left her water pot because she was filled with the true water. And she went out into the community and began to share with everyone what just happened to her heart. I believe that in a place of worship, as we counter Jesus, that he begins to make us missional. Amen? I want you to turn to your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28. And then I'm going to read this verse and then I want to um, share some, some testimonies with you. Matthew 28 verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee into the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Don't you know it's possible that some people can be right next to Jesus and they still live with doubt and unbelief? But look at this. It goes on. It says, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and he spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of age. Amen. We see that in, in Bob, praying for Bob, that we get a burden for the loss. We get compassion for the loss. We recognize opportunity, but we need boldness. And I want to submit to you that evangelism and discipleship was never meant to be divorced. They're connected together. And so many times we say, well, that's evangelism or that's discipleship. But in the Great Commission, it's connected. It's going and it's making, it's teaching, it's making disciples that will make disciples that will make disciples. I want to show you a video in just a moment. I was at a church service in Redding, California. I was at the leaders' events. And I've learned over the years that I am not the one that tells God what I'm going to do. I am the one that responds to his voice and I submit to his voice and I say, yes, Lord, I will obey and one of the things that happens when we position our heart as children of God, we give him full place in our life, in our will, to be able to say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Do you know that Jesus even submitted his will to the Father? He had a surrendered will. So we were at the leaders' events in Redding, California, and while I was at the leaders' events, great leaders from all over 
the world. And the first song that came on is, I want to be where you are. Who's ever sang that song before? I just want to be where you are. So Jim Johnson is singing that song. And the Spirit of the Lord speaks to me. And he interrupted my worship service. Now, what I'm about ready to do and, and share with you may challenge some of your thought process of what worship is. But the Lord spoke to me. And he says, if you want to be where I'm at right now, leave. Go down to 273. There's someone I want you to talk to. A religious mindset says, don't ever leave the presence. The presence is right here. Don't get out of the presence. But we have to recognize the voice of the Lord. When the word of the Lord comes, that is his presence. And so the Lord says, I want you to leave right now. There's someone that I want you to pray for. There's someone tonight that I want you to minister to. So I leave the, the gathering and I, I could have kept my hands up and I could have fooled a lot of people. But I wouldn't be fooling God. So I leave, I drive. And 15 minutes away, I'm at 273. And the Lord says, I want to commission someone tonight to be an evangelist. So I drive up. And I see this guy that's got a hoodie on. And I feel in my heart, you know, you could see someone, you're like, that's, that's the person. You just, you just know in your heart, that's the person. I thought that's the person. So I drive up. And I said, hey, excuse me. Uh, I don't know if this makes sense, man, but the Lord sent me here. I need to pray for you. I said, I'm going to park my car. I said, come over here. He says, what's your name? I said, my name is Chris Overstreet. He said, prove it to me. He said, give me your ID. Now, listen, I've never had anyone on the streets before ask me for my ID. I've had the police ask me for my ID, but I have never had anyone ask me for my ID. So I give him my ID. I'm like, you want to see my ID? Here's my ID. He said, this is crazy. I can't believe this is happening. Before you pray for me, I have to tell you something. He said, I was raised in this town over 15 years ago. My parents were drug dealers and I was taken out of my home and I was put into foster care. My foster grandma told me that one day I need to meet Chris Overstreet and that Chris Overstreet will help you. Oh, it gets better. Oh, it gets better. Oh, it gets better. I found out a little bit later that 10 days prior to him meeting me, he was at a trap house. Do you guys know what a trap house is? A trap house is a drug house and prostitution. And he leaves at around 3 a.m. in the morning. And he's walking down this bridge and he says, God, you hate me. You hate my life. Look at my life. He says, God, if you really love me, then where is that Chris Overstreet that my grandma would talk about? If you really love me, then tell Chris Overstreet exactly where I'm at and send him to me. If you really love me, then send him to me. I want to tell you guys, I'm going to share a couple other testimonies too, but I could have missed it if I had a religious mindset. A mindset that said, no, only what God wants to do is inside this building. So I pray for him. The power of God comes on him. I want you to show that video, please. My name is Gerald Lynch. 
and uh, I was born and raised in Redding, California. The first 10 years of my life were extremely traumatic for myself and my younger siblings. My parents were heavily involved in uh, drug dealing and were extremely abusive. December 27, 2005, my siblings and I were removed from the home and placed into a Christian foster home. I was dealing with a lot of trauma uh, from my childhood, post-traumatic stress disorder type symptoms, extreme amount of anxiety. And so as I aged and developed into a, into a mature man, there was still so much trauma in my heart and so much pain that that pain then led me to finding sin and other things, trying to fill this void in my heart. I actually completely lost like pretty much everything and uh, was actually staying at the Good News Rescue Mission in Redding, California. And one night I was walking back to the mission. It was like 8.30 at night, getting ready to check in to go to bed. And I had my hood on and I was drinking this Dutch Bros, listening to music. And then all of a sudden, this, this SUV pulls in and then pulls up and around to the street that I'm on and rolled his window down. And he said, hey, can I talk to you? God sent me. And immediately I felt the hair stand up on my arms like this was the presence of God. And I said, absolutely, I would love to speak with you. And he immediately just started commissioning me to be an evangelist. And there was a fire in his eyes, a, a focus that I'd never seen in any other man. I could feel the presence of God come around us and I immediately started to weep. And then he said, God, show me what I saw in the vision. And then boom, I fell back on the hood of his car and I felt something come out of me and I felt the presence of God completely surround my entire body. And so day by day after this encounter, Chris continued to stay in touch with me, uh, mentoring me, showing me love, pouring into me. I became so on fire for the Lord and just to be obedient to every call of the Holy Spirit from that day forward. Well, on Thanksgiving day, Chris actually put me in a hotel and when he put me in the hotel, he prophesied that God was going to encounter me in a way that he had never before. That night, I had a dream that Jesus actually gave me a new mind. So I felt the weight of the truth behind his words immediately fall on my heart and in my head. And I knew God had done a mighty work. The following day, I felt this tug on my heart like to go to Goodwill. When I got there, there was a gentleman there who is uh, clearly less fortunate. And I immediately felt the call of God to just tell him how much Jesus loves him. In that moment, the Holy Spirit completely fell over him and he accepted Christ. And it was the most beautiful thing that I've ever been a part of. From that day forward, encounter after encounter after encounter has been happening like that. In the meantime, Chris and the body of Christ was working on trying to help me find stable living um, because Chris had really felt from the Lord that I wasn't to be homeless anymore. He felt that that was the will of God. I ended up moving into a house with three other dudes who all graduated BSSM, School of Ministry. And it's the perfect community for me because I'm surrounded by other brothers in the body of Christ to continue to sharpen me while I'm on this journey. Through this process, Chris has continued to stay in touch with me, constantly pouring into me, mentoring me. He actually, at one point of us meeting in Reading, invited me to come to Phoenix. I knew that I was about to embark on on literally stepping into the will of God. And it was a super long drive, but I was so excited for the next day. And we headed over to our location where we're gonna be doing the main event at. And as we were huddling up in a prayer circle before we went out to pass out the flyers for the event and to evangelize, the people who live here in Phoenix were introducing themselves. As this woman began to introduce herself as Stephanie, I instantly knew who she was. When I looked over, I saw her husband there next to her as well, and his name is Jason. And I instantly knew that those were the first foster parents that my two younger siblings, Roy and Emily, that was their first home that they were in back when we were removed December 27, 2005, about 15, 16 years ago. And so it was just this miraculous moment. But then as she began to tell me more and more about her journey and where she's been the last 15 years, she said that when I was 10 years old, she knew that the Lord had called me to be an evangelist. When she said that, I just began to weep even more. And I just know that this is the will of God for me to be here in Phoenix evangelizing. God has been moving in power the entire time I've been here. I know that the purpose of my testimony is to give hope and to plant seeds in people's hearts of love and of truth and of power. So if I could share one message with the world, it would be that that same love that impacted me that day, that found me, wants to find you. And that same love that changed my heart, changed my mind, and changed the way that I was living forever. 
wants to change you. Jesus, what will compassion lead us to do? It's his love. And it's in, it's in his presence when we recognize his presence and what he's speaking. You know, the very fact that he speaks to us is a, is a sign of his love. A sign of his compassion for us. But when we respond to his voice and we yield to his voice and we recognize the opportunities, what we do is we tell him, I love you back. I love you back. One, one simple act of obedience is a sign of love. It's a sign of saying, you love me so much. I want to love you back. That my life is no longer my life, but it belongs to you. You know, following Jesus was never meant to be Convenient. I want you to turn to your Bibles to Mark chapter 1, verse 16. Verse 16, it says this, and, and he walked by the Sea of Galilee, and he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And then Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Let's, let's read that one more time. Then Jesus said to them, follow me. Say, follow me. And I will make you become fishers of men. Come on, say, and I will make you become fishers of men. Then immediately they left their nets and followed him. And when they had gone a little bit further from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them and left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired servants. And they went after him. Uh, Mitchell, Mitchell's my assistant here. Uh, can you guys give Mitchell a hand clap? <laughs> Mitchell's with me for a year. And thank you, Mitchell. And, um, and then we're going to launch him out to start his own uh, ministry. Um, but the Lord says, follow me and I'll make you become fishers of men. There's something about the following Jesus. I want you to think about when you first started following Jesus. And, and let me just first by congratulating individuals. If you just recently surrendered your life within the last year and you started following Jesus, can you raise your hand within the last year? Can we just thank these guys and just say, God bless you. Keep your hands up. God bless you. 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 There's something that takes place when we recognize the voice of God and we begin to follow Jesus. It is in the following where we discover his love for us, his presence, how he moves and how he operates. It is in the following the voice of the Lord and being connected with him, the very source that he enlists us to become his disciple. And as we draw near to Jesus, and as we become his disciple and not convert, which is a big difference, we become his disciple, something begins to happen inside of us where we draw near to him and he begins to form something inside of us. He begins to develop our insides, our whole being, spirit, soul, and body begins to be changed and transformed. It is in the following that he begins to develop us. And I want to encourage every one of you right now that you are, if you're following him, he is developing you right now. He is developing you to become a disciple that will make disciples that will make disciples. It is in the following that he makes you a fisher of men. And so I want to talk about some stories of just following Jesus and, and in the process of following, he makes us. He makes us. I was getting ready to go to the gym. And as I was getting ready to go to the gym, and by the way, I used to weigh 400 pounds. 
At one time in my life, I weighed 400 pounds. And, um, and one of the first steps that I, that I took about following the Lord is getting his word in my mouth. And the Lord said to me, because when I weighed 400 pounds, I would constantly give myself a hard time. So after I got saved, he began to take me through a process of stop criticizing yourself. He says, get my word in your mouth and begin to speak it and begin to declare it. And so I, I, I lost weight and, and I'm at this gym. And while I'm at the gym, I, um, I, or while I'm driving to the gym, I'm, I'm getting ready to pull in pretty soon. The Spirit of the Lord speaks to me and he says, Chris, go to the gun shop. Now, I, I, I appreciate guns, but what he's about ready to say next to me shocked me. He says, go to the gun shop. They're having a Bible study. So I called Gerald up. So I, I'm discipling Gerald of how do, you, how do you recognize the voice of the Lord and how do you quickly obey? How many people know that quick obedience is the best obedience? Delayed obedience is disobedience. You know, we have an eight-year-old and a, and a, and a two-year-old, and, and we try to teach them quick obedience is the best obedience. Don't, don't say when I get ready, quickly obey right now. Change your heart, quickly obey right now. And so I, I called Gerald up, and I, I said, Gerald, it's happening, and I want to I take you through the process. I have the impression where the Lord spoke to me and he's asking me to go to a certain place. I don't know what's about ready to happen, but I'm following him. And it's in the following where he develops us. And so I, I drive to this gun shop, which is about 15, 20 minutes away. And as I drive to the gun shop, as I pull in, I said, Gerald, it's about ready to happen right now. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm here. As I walk in, I see people that have their Bible. They're having a Bible study at the gun shop. I just so happen to have my Bible with me. I go in, I take my Bible, and they're studying about Hebrews entering into the rest of the Lord. And you, you can't hear the voice of the Lord trying so hard. You hear the voice of the Lord by resting in his presence, by resting in him. You know, anxiety oftentimes clutters out the ability to hear his voice. And so that's why it's so important to be able to stay in the peace of God. So I, I go in, I sit down, and as I sit down, um, they're talking about entering into the rest of the Lord. And after the Bible study was over, I go to the leader. I say, excuse me, this, this may not make sense, but I was on my way to the gym, and the Lord spoke to my heart that there was a Bible study that was happening here. By any chance, anyone here have any pain in their back here? And he points to a woman over there and she says, I think she has pain in her back because they had talked a little bit earlier. And so she came over and I prayed for her back and then she got healed and then she says, pray for my hip. And, and I said, well, just put your hand on your hip right there. So she puts her hand on her hip. I put my hand over her hand. I command all the pain to leave. All the pain leaves. And she says, pray for my knee now. And I, and I said, just okay. Uh, uh, I, uh, so I pray for her knee and she gets healed. And the next thing I know, there's six more people lined up that we're ministering to, that I'm ministering to. And the power of God is just coming upon them. So something happens in our heart that says, God, I, I, I want to feel what you feel about people. I, I want to hear your voice. I remember we're going to, I'm getting ready to go to um, a meeting at Red Robin. How many people appreciate Red Robin's fries? Okay, yep. you guys appreciate the fries. Uh, my daughter loves the fries. Brielle, you know, if we're going to go to Red Robin, I know exactly what she wants. She wants fries and she wants broccoli and that amazing sauce. And then we force her to eat a little bit of chicken. And, but that's what she wants. I mean, she just wants, she loves the fries. And so I'm getting ready to have a meeting the next day. And I'm meeting with someone that um, I don't really know too well. But I said, Lord, I don't want to just have a meeting to have a meeting. There's a, a potential individual that wanted to, you know, invest into our ministry. And I, I said, God, I don't want to just have a meeting to have a meeting. I want you to show up in power. Something began to happen in my heart. I want you to recognize this. The moment you feel something. 
a desire, an impression. It is an opportunity to ask for more. So I said, Lord, show up. Would you do something tomorrow? And I could feel his heart pulling me in. I said, what do you want to do? This is what he said. He said, the person, whoever waits on you, is going to have a problem in their stomach. And you're going to pray for them. And I'm going to heal them. So we're sitting down. We get our food. We order. And uh, after we order, we eat. And the waitress comes to me. She gives us the bill. And I said, excuse me, ma'am. I don't know if this makes sense or not. But last night, I was praying. And I asked the Lord to show me. What did he want to do? And the first thing I saw was that whoever waits on me is going to have a problem with their stomach. I said, do you have a stomach issue? And she says, yes, I do. And I said, the Lord has sent me here to lay my hands on you and to command all the pain to leave your body. I get up. As I get up, the Spirit of God comes upon her life. I lay my hands on her. She's weeping and crying. And I recognize it's a demon. And so in Red Robin, I begin to command that demon to come out of her abdomen, come off of her and out of her. And the power of God comes on her. She bends over like this. She's completely healed under the power of the Lord. And then I noticed some people right behind me that the healing anointing is upon them. And I said, the spirit of God is upon your shoulders right now. The healing power of God is upon you. So this miracle breakout began to break out. Months later go by. Months later go by. And I go into a different restaurant and I'm, I'm meeting with some former interns of mine. And, uh, and I go and I sit down. And this woman sees me from afar and, and she comes over and she says, do you remember me? You pray for me in my stomach. I'm completely healed. I haven't had any issues since then. She works two jobs and that woman was completely healed by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that the Lord is moving right now on our families. I believe that God is moving in our families. I believe that fathers and mothers and children are working together to express the kingdom of God. But I've also realized from my own experience that sometimes it's not convenient. Sometimes your kids, my daughter, will want to do things that quite honestly I don't want to do at the time. Let me share just a story with you. So we, uh, it was a particular Saturday. My daughter says, I want to go around the neighborhood and pray for people and share Jesus with people. And I was, uh, I was, it was a busy week and I, and I was thinking to myself, how can I get out of this? I'm being honest. Could I throw the family card and say, we just need to be together as a family. Let's just, you know, Brielle, please, you know, you know, there's a lot of ways that Bri please, Brielle, don't know, not today. But I could feel the heart of God for my daughter. That why would I want to rob her of this opportunity? Because it's a teaching moment. So we go around the neighborhood, knock on some doors and and we start sharing Jesus with people. And one of our neighbors walks across the street. And, and, um, and we say, excuse me, is there anything that you need prayer for? She says, my leg. I said, Brielle, well, you wanted to be able to, to pray for people today. Why don't you pray for her? Now, she's a young little girl. You know how she prays? And I think we can learn from this. She took her hand out of her pocket. And she prayed this prayer. Jesus bless. Amen. That's it. I said, test it out. She says, all the pain is gone. I said, are you saying that? Are you saying that because she's a young kid? Are you, are you serious? She said, no, all the pain is gone. I said, praise God. Isn't that awesome? That's Jesus. So we're walking through the mall, and let me just submit this to you guys as apostolic leaders here in the Northwest. Um, I believe that the Lord is going to raise up apostolic leaders here in the Northwest and beyond that is going to confront demonic spirits, and I and and in a in a way like uh, uh, bonfires. Um, you know, in the book of Acts, we see in Acts, I believe it's Acts 19, where they begin to have um, uh, these bonfires of individuals that have repented of witchcraft, and they begin to burn 
burn articles of, of witchcraft. I just wrote a, I just, I just wrote a book called Capturing Heaven's Attention. And in the book, I, I share what I saw in the vision of uh, leaders across America that where courage will come alive inside of them and they'll call their congregation, they'll call city, cities into repentance and there will be bonfires of individuals bringing Harry Potters and burning Harry Potters across America. It will go wild. It will go wild. But I see that taking place across this area. And so my daughter and I, we're, we're in the mall. And, and as we're in the mall, we're handing out Bibles. And because we have these little New Testament Bibles that we just hand out. And, and let me just say this right now. One of the greatest strategies for evangelism is the Word of God. Get it into people's hands. We have been handing out these New Testaments, and I am so excited to be able to see the results of individuals that says, thanks so much for looking out. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you. Yes, I need a Bible. Thank you. I was thinking about that. Thank you so much. I am surprised right now. In the, in the last 20-some years of evangelism, doing evangelism and training and equipping other people, there is more hunger right now than I'm seeing for the Word of God. God than I have ever seen in my life. But there still is a little bit of resistance. And I, I taught my daughter about resistance. I want to share a story with you. And this is what fathers and mothers do when they face resistance. So we're going through the mall and we're handing out Bibles and people are excited and I talked to this one gentleman. I said, I said, hey, would you like to have a Bible? He says, no, thanks. And we turn around 50. He turns around as we about 15, 20 feet away. And he yells out, hail Satan. As if that's going to intimidate me. <laughs> but I looked at Brielle. And I said, Brielle. Not everyone wants Jesus. There are some people that oppose the cross of Jesus Christ. And I said, I'm so glad that you were here today to be able to see this. Because there are some people that don't want Jesus. The Bible talks about that. You know, there are many individuals that say, well, if they just knew how Jesus is, how wonderful Jesus is, they'll all accept him. It's not biblical. It's not biblical because they saw how wonderful he was. They walked with him. They saw him. And yet they still put him on the cross. But there's an urgency in our heart and our spirit that our desire is that none shall perish. But the Bible doesn't teach or preach universalism. The Bible talks about judgment. The Bible talks about a heaven. The Bible talks about a hell. The Bible talks about an urgency of preaching the gospel. But this comes out of a compassion. It comes out of a love that we've encountered. And then when we face resistance, that we don't back down because they're not our enemy. Amen. They're not our enemy. I looked at these two young people at the mall and I felt in my heart that I just need to talk to them. And as I started talking to them, one of them, they were on 16 some years old and they said, well, I go to church. I said, well, that's great that you go to church. I said, just going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Just like going to McDonald's doesn't make you a cheeseburger. Talk about the importance to being born again. Conversation in John chapter 3, where Jesus has a conversation with Nicodemus. Jesus says, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. She says, well, I'm Wicca. I said, well, why would you want to serve a loser? In a loving way, why would you want to serve a loser? He's going to burn in hell for all of eternity. 
Why would you want to serve a loser? I felt the spirit of the Lord speak to my heart. That she knows about blood at a very young age. And so I began to share with her about there's some blood that she puts her faith in. But I said, there's one blood that was shed over 2,000 years ago that will never dry up, and it is the blood of Jesus Christ. The cat's blood will dry up, the chicken's blood will dry up, but the blood of Jesus Christ will never dry up, and it has the power to cleanse all sins. Something happens when we, when we're aware of the power of the blood. Knowing the awareness of the power of the blood activates compassion because we realize what we have been forgiven of. Knowing the power of the blood activates the awareness that we can have opportunities all around us. But knowing the power of the blood also activates us to have a boldness to be able to speak the word of God. Now, let me just say this really quickly, because in just a moment, we're going to pray. And I know that boldness can grow. Boldness can grow. And it's not based around our personality type. It's not even based around our giftings. It's based around the person. I used to be afraid to wear a Christian t-shirt. After I got saved, the Lord challenged me. He said, put a Christian t-shirt on. And I wrestled with him. And he said, put a Christian t-shirt on. And I said, I don't want to. I was honest. I said, I don't want to. And I'm thinking, what will people think about me? And he said, well, that's the problem. I put that Christian t-shirt on and I'm shaking inside. And the reason why I share this story is because the Lord is going to ask some of you to do some things that you do not feel qualified for. And you may feel intimidated at first, just like I was when I put that Christian t-shirt on. But there's something about following Jesus that as we follow and we submit to him, he makes us become what we're called to be in him. I put that Christian t-shirt on. I go into Walmart and, and I'm looking around. I'm like, I'm trying to avoid people. And next thing I know, five minutes later, someone comes up that I used to go to school with and say, hey, Chris, wow, nice shirt. And I knew that I could say, well, it's just a t-shirt or I could tell them the truth. And I said, Jesus has changed my life. I'm not the same person that I used to be. You know what he did? He said, oh, good for you. Gave me a two thumbs up and walked away. I didn't pray for him. I didn't minister to him. All I did was share my story. As he walked away, I walked away. I felt like somebody was raised from the dead and it was myself. I wore that Christian t-shirt for so long, man, it became a holy t-shirt. I'm telling you, it became a holy t-shirt. But then after months, the Lord says, I don't want you to rely on that anymore. I want you to just go up to people that I'm leading you to, and I want you to talk to them and tell them about me. And then I begin to get breakthrough. I begin to get breakthrough. I begin to get breakthrough. But it was in the following Jesus. We're going to pray in just a moment. As we pray, I, I know that the Holy Spirit wants to to touch people's lives. How many people are hungry to feel the heart of God more? You want to you want to feel the heart of God more. How many people you want to recognize the opportunities that God is presenting in front of you? Come on. How many people you say I need more boldness in my life? All of us. There's opportunities that God gives all the time, all the time, all the time. We've got to recognize them. I'm going to show one more video, and then I want to pray for people. And uh, I want to pray for these creative miracles in the marketplace to be released.
creative miracles. I love seeing God do things inside of the four walls, but I love the creative miracle realm outside of the four walls of the church and the Walmarts and the, and the malls and the, and the highways and the byways. I love people stepping out and seeing creative miracles. I want to show you a video that was uh, captured a few years ago of a, a woman named Janie that was healed in a wheelchair and how this miracle changed her life. Go ahead and show that video, please. My name is Janie Tifo. I was born in Salem, Oregon, and I'm currently living in Corvallis, Oregon right now. It was actually back in 2005 when I had the first onset of Guillain-Barre. It came on very quickly. Uh, one day I just woke up and I wasn't able to walk. It is an autoimmune disease, and what autoimmunity does is that it, it's your own body attacking some part of your body. And in my case, it was the myelar covering around the nerves. My life before the disease, I was very active. You know, I had a full-time job. I would go to the gym. I would go out to dinner and go to the movies, all sorts of things. I was very active. Once the disease took place, I kind of became a hermit. I was very depressed, severely depressed, actually. It was a very difficult time because I didn't really know what my purpose was. I had dreams, I had things that I wanted to do, and I thought, there's no way that this can happen now. I had gone to Fish Fest with a friend of mine, she's a neighbor of mine, and we got to see um, some of the music and everything, and I was just kind of sitting in my wheelchair waiting for her to come back. I had some gentlemen approach me from Compassion to Action, and they asked if they could pray for me, and I said yes. I actually didn't feel anything at first, you know, it was, they were praying for me, and then um, all of a sudden I felt some warmth. And then I felt some um, electricity going into my legs, and it was so exciting. And I, it, it scared me a little bit at first, because I was like, what is this, you know? Um, and so <laughs> it, the electricity came, the warmth came, and um, out of uh, faith, the young men told me to just step out in faith and walk. And I was like, Okay, I'm gonna do this, and I did. And I was kind of wobbly at first, and it was, it was scary because you know I I didn't want to fall. But all of a sudden, I felt like there were these braces on my legs that were strengthening my legs. It was just supernatural, and it was it was so awesome. I can't explain the the feeling, but it was like there were these braces on my leg, and all of a sudden, my legs had strength strength that they never had before. I felt like a release on life. Just the, just the power of God is just so awesome. And I, I can't say that enough. I just keep saying awesome, awesome, awesome. That's my newfound word for it because there's just no other way to, to describe it. <laughs> God's love is really, he does love us. And um, he loves me. I struggled with um, the depression and just um, not feeling like he loved me. And um, he does. This is what I, this is what I want you to do. If you, need a, if you need a touch from God right now, if you need a miracle in your body, just quickly stand to your feet right now. As you stand to your feet, what I want you to do is I want you to put your faith in the Son of God, Jesus, the healer, the healer, the deliverer. The healing power of the Lord is here right now. 
the presence of God is here right now. And what I want you to do is I don't want you to wait for anyone to lay hands on you. The Bible says that there's healing when we lay hands. The, the, the believers will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. But there's also healing in his presence. And, and his presence is here. And so what we want to do is we just want to recognize the presence of God. And we'll, we'll lay hands on people if we need to. But uh, then after that, we're going to pray for boldness. We're going to pray for a release of boldness to preach the gospel. And if this is, uh, if you're here and you haven't fully surrendered your life, uh, today would be a wonderful day and opportunity for you to be able to do that, to give everything to the Lord Jesus. But as right now, as you're standing up, I want you to, I want you to put your faith in Jesus. Because his healing power is here right now. Some of you are feeling his presence just come upon your body right now. There's healing that's taking place. Jesus' name. Lord, you want your body whole. Want your body healthy. Want your body fit. This is your desire. This is your will. If you, if you just felt pain, leave your body. You have physical pain and, and you just felt pain, just leave your body. I, I would just wave your, wave your hand right now. You just felt pain, leave your body. Just go ahead and wave your hand right now. If you had pain and now it's all gone and it's all gone, just raise your hand if it's all gone right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for what you're doing there. Anyone else who had pain in your body and it's all gone right now. Thank you, God. For what we're going to do right now is um, if you're around those individuals, just quickly lay your hands upon them. I know that you guys do this a lot here. Ask them where the pain is at. And just uh, what I want you to do is I don't want you to pray long prayer. I just want you to take authority over it. And I want you to command the pain to leave their body, their sickness, the disease, whatever is going on in their body, to command it to leave their body. In the name of Jesus, go ahead and just take a moment and just command all the paint to leave their body. Father, we thank you, God, for your healing anointing. 100% healing. 100% healing. Someone's abdomen is being healed right now. Someone's abdomen's being healed right now. There's something that's been going on with someone's abdomen. You're being healed in the mighty name of Jesus. Who is that? You've been having abdomen problems. Raise your hand right now. The healing presence of God is upon you. Thank you, Lord. Put your hand. Yep. In Jesus' name, be completely healed. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Be healed in the name of Jesus. There's a difference between a miracle and a healing. A healing is progressive. A miracle is instantaneous. So we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Lord, we bless what you're doing right now. Go ahead and stop. If, if all the pain just left their body, just go ahead and raise your hand right now. All the pain just left your body. Go ahead and test it out. Try to do something you couldn't do before. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing over here. Thank you, God, for what you're doing here. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing here. Thank you, God, for what you're doing right there, Lord. We bless what you're doing. We bless what you're doing. We bless what you're doing. Thank you, God. Are you raising your hand because you're 100%? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Keep your hand up if you're 100% healed. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. 
the ministry team, I just want to invite the ministry team to be able to come up here. Thank you, God. Thank you for what you're doing. Just a moment, I just want to pray for the Holy Spirit to, to touch people's lives, that he would fall on you, power you. You know, one of the things that was in my heart when I was driving here, we drove two and a half hours to be here with you, is, is that the Spirit would fall upon to, to mark people this morning. And I believe His Spirit is here to mark people. And I want to pray, you know, the Bible says in Acts 4, 29, 31, Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word while you stretch out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders will be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And there are individuals here that are saying, God, I need you to mark my life. I need you to touch me. And I, and I remember when the Spirit of the Lord came upon my life when I was a young man. He, was, he baptized me in the Holy Spirit in fire. And I want to invite the Holy Spirit. There are people that are being touched here. There's still healing that are being taking place right now. But I want to invite the Holy Spirit to mark people. And this is what I want you to do. I just want you to hold your hands out like this. Just ask the Holy Spirit to mark you. I want to pray for boldness. Some of you are going to feel the Spirit of the Lord come upon you. You're going to feel maybe fire on your hands. You may feel a burning in your heart. I just want to invite you in just a moment when we begin to pray to come forward. If that's you, just go ahead and respond and say, Lord, give me your burden, Lord. God, open up my eyes to see opportunity. And Lord, ignite me to be a bold witness for you. So just lift your hands to the Lord. I can't manufacture anything. The Spirit is here. Holy Spirit, you're real. Come and touch people. Come and touch people, Lord. Come fill right now. Fill to overflow. Come with your fire. Come with your presence. Touch right now. Touch right now. If you feel fire on your hands or you feel a burning in your heart or you feel just emotional, the Holy Spirit's doing something in your heart, I just want to invite you to just get up out of your seats and come forward and, and just receive what the Lord is doing in your life right now. If that's you, you feel the Spirit of the Lord touching you, just come forward right now. The Spirit of God wants to fall upon, fall upon you. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. You can just make your way out of your, your seat right now. If the Spirit of the Lord is touching you, just come forward and just receive from the Spirit of the Lord. Some of you just, yeah, just come and receive. Don't, some of you are not even going to have anyone lay hands on you and the Spirit of God's just going to fall upon you. Just receive right now. More Holy Spirit. More Holy Spirit. Have your way. More Holy Spirit. Have your way. Come feel, Lord. Come feel right now. This woman in the white here, this woman right here, the Spirit of God's upon you. He's doing something new. Just receive right now. He's doing it in your life. More Holy Spirit, touch her. More Holy Spirit, touch, Lord. Fire of God. Fire of God. More Holy Spirit. All over this place. There's a boldness that God's going to release from this house. There's a tenacity. There's a boldness of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit preaching the gospel. We thank you, God, for what you're doing. Say, have your way, Lord. 
have your way. I'm reminded of a young woman that got touched a while back. The Spirit of the Lord fell upon her. And since then, she's led over 3,000 people to the Lord. Personally, over 3,000 people to the Lord. So I'm asking, Holy Spirit, that you would fall upon people. I'm asking God for your boldness, God, that you would infuse, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, with fire. Come have your way, Lord. Come have your way. Come, God, have your way. Thank you, Lord. Spirit, move, Lord. Come, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit, touch. Come, touch. Come, touch. This young girl in the very back, just raise your hands to the Lord. Yeah, the, the Spirit of God is upon you. God's going to do something new in your life. Lord, touch this one in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Lord. Let your anointing rest upon her, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm just going to continue to minister to some people here. I'm going to turn it over to Apostle Tom. Or Thank you so much for watching. I hope you were blessed and encouraged. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more amazing content.